Welcome to this extraordinary Smart Transport Summit. Uh, we invite Professor Dr. Engineer Colonel Panait, the President of Senate of uh, Constanza Maritime University. Good morning. Thank you very much for your participation here. As a maritime university, we have a lot of challenges about how to organize, how to proceed with, with this Smart Transport. Today, more than 90% of all the cargo in the whole world is transported by ships. We are trying to have, first of all, a smart transport regarding the ships, but also about, about the routes, about how to configure the next future of our industry. I am very, very interested to see what is your opinions about smart transport. All your remarks and we'll try to obtain the best information about how to organize and how to implement the conclusions. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Professor Dr. Engineer Colonel Panait. Now we have a special opening uh, introduction. It is great honor to deliver an introductory speech at Smart Transport Summit. I'd like to congratulate all organizational committee, including the Constanta Maritime University, one of the members of this association for arranging this great summit. My congratulations also goes to Christina Dragomir, host and moderator of this summit for her successful completion of IMU project in 2018. We, the IMU is an association of higher educa maritime education institutions with 67 member universities from the 35 different countries. The IMU aims to be a global leader in maritime capacity buildings through networking and excellence in maritime education and training. One of our tasks is to communicate and cooperate with other associations and industry to ensure that the human elements and the MET plays a key priority role to supply industry with high quality professionals to promote safe, secure, and efficient shipping on clean oceans. As a recent achievement of the IMU, for the purpose to meet the needs of the industry and the rapidly evolving the education and a career context while catering for the professional development as aspiration of individual seafarers, we established a new initiative so-called as Global Maritime Professional and published the body of knowledge in 2019. With respect to the task of the IMU for achieving the sustainable development goals, of course, uh, first is the, to provide in the quality education, which listed as goal four of the UN SDGs. We shall keep providing the quality education and training for providing the global maritime professional to the industry. It is undoubtedly that fourth industrial liberation comes too, and all transportation sectors have been impacted. It is therefore extremely important for all stakeholders to share and exchange ideas on how best to create future model of transport beyond the boundary of industries. Thank you very much. We are listening now to the Ministry of Sustainable Development from Romania, Mr. Laszlo Berbeli. I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event. I would like to thank the uh, Maritime University from Constanza and the other partners for organizing this meeting, why it's important. We have one planet and we have this initiative uh, inside uh, European Union and of course with other partners regarding a blue economy. We have the Black Sea here in Romania and of course we have partners in the region. Uh, I am leading the uh, department, for, uh, de department for Sustainable Development uh, near the Prime Minister's office and since three years ago we started to revise our strategy for sustainable development. We have a new strategy. We have we, uh, started to have an action plan until 2030 and of course a very important part of this between 
uh, the 17 SDGs uh, and 169 targets are related to uh, uh, water and the blue economy and uh, uh, oceans and sea. Uh, why we are uh, engaged on this? Uh, at the European Union, uh, from next year, we will have the report of each country based on European semester, based on uh, the 17 SDGs. We have to prepare ourselves. And uh, of course, we have to uh, uh, establish, uh, and we, we established uh, uh, since this moment, uh, an interdepartmental committee for sustainable development led by the prime minister and a consultative council, which means the people involved in this field from academic area, from NGOs and other civil society. We are always open to the partnership and uh, the SDG 17, which is the base of the partnership in this field, for us it means it is a very important uh, part of the cooperation, Black Sea. And uh, we have BSEC, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. We have the presidency of this and we will organize next month uh, with all the coordinators on this region for sustainable development to analyze a little bit in which stage we are with the implementation of Agenda 2030. We had a very good collaboration and we organized several meetings with Black Sea University Network. We have in this moment several SDGs related to blue economy. We have of course SDG 14, which is directly related uh, with transport and uh, all these issues related to blue economy. We have uh, climate change and it's important to use the transport, maritime transport, which is one of the most uh, friendly if we are speaking about uh, reduction of greenhouse emissions and uh, to have a better and healthier environment. And of course, SDG 9, which is uh, uh, of course to have strong infrastructure and possibilities to use this kind of uh, um, transport. Uh, I have to tell you uh, some words about uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen is one of the most uh, important renewable energy for the future. Of course, there are some issues, some questions to uh, solve. Uh, regarding hydrogen, the security of hydrogen, uh, the price, of course, of the production. But there are a lot of companies uh, interested in Romania because we have a strong research center and we will have a hub on this. And of course, it's related to transport, not just to the Danube, because we have to use this opportunity of Romania, but also uh, the transport uh, on maritime side. Uh, so, uh, we have this port of Constanza, which is one of the uh, most important ports of Europe. And uh, uh, as I uh, know, and uh, uh, the general director will be uh, in, uh, in this panel, uh, he will tell you more, but uh, they, they have a lot of uh, programs in this, the digitalization, the interconnection of this area. So, we need partnerships. We need more uh, um, knowledge about how we put together different uh, legislation, different uh, approach of the maritime transport. But we are here, our department, our government, to help this. We have this uh, 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 program of um, green recovery of Romania until 2030. It's about 100 billion euros and uh, we will need each other to do more for sustainable development. And now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this tremendous opportunity to share with you uh, UNIDO services linked to sustainable city and smart transport in developing countries. There is an evidence of change that uh, we can observe in urbanization as 60% of the world's population 
uh, will live in the cities by 2030, whereas 80% of uh, all urban growth in the next 20 years will take place in Asia and in Africa. A sustainable city, as you can see, is a, a city which is competitive, resilient, integrated and smart, meaning that it will use modern technology to uh, improve the quality of life of the population while uh, improving also the efficiency of uh, urban operations and increase the city's uh, competitivity. It will meet the generation's needs in the present and in the future. Developing sustainable cities, in fact, uh, requires an integrated intervention. And UNIDO is providing a package of uh, services supported by cross-cutting uh, themes, which might include uh, green technology innovations, uh, climate resilience, um, urban inclusivity, and of course, partnership development and uh, networks for cities. Bridge for Cities is also one of UNIDO's uh, tool or approach to sustainable cities. It is in fact a forum for mayors and uh, municipal stakeholders to discuss how to tap into advanced technology and new industrial solutions to improve the quality of life and well-being of the populations. For its uh, fifth edition, and with the COVID pandemic, the focus will be on how to build back better and achieve inclusive, innovative and green economic recovery. When it comes to a sustainable city, when we say sustainable city, it is a smart city in which transport is a key element. So UNIDO offers uh, an integrated package a set of interventions which uh, uh, include uh, energy, agribusiness development, uh, business investment and technology services, and of course, um, uh, environment. By and large, you know, those uh, intervention is composed of proposing and enabling uh, policy framework, capacity building and technology transfer. Melaka in Malaysia and Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire are two examples of uh, UNIDO's assistance in the field of sustainable transport and in partnership with the Global Environment Facility and local government. Both projects started in 2015 and they are still ongoing. For Melaka, the initiative includes uh, uh, addressing uh, the energy, transportation and building segments within the, the city planning activities, whereas in uh, Abidjan, uh, it seeks to improve mobility planning, resilient transport infrastructure and uh, include various uh, initiatives to improve the urban air quality. Here are some key facts on the public transportation within the city of Antananarive. Um, we have um, a road network which is uh, insufficient in terms of uh, infrastructure. Transportation services are yet inadequate and there is an uncontrolled uh, road traffic. The number of vehicles on the road has been steadily increasing for almost half a century with an annual growth of 10.6%. With this ever-increasing traffic jam, JECA interestingly estimated the cost of uh, annual congestion to US dollar 10 million. Additionally, parking is also an issue because uh, the offer of um, spaces managed by the municipality is far from sufficient and there is a high level of, uh, high rate of informal on-street parking. So, uh, faced with such a uh, high costs and uh, a fragile economy, you would agree with me that um, uh, there is something to be done, something must be done, in fact. The municipality ambitions to modernize its uh, public transportation services and make it smart it would start with the revision of the wall traffic plan, restructuring the, the public minibus here called Taxi Bay, and um, using uh, advanced technologies to um, improve the traffic monitoring system, 
uh, dematerialize the payment system and, of course, new technologies in public places. Plus, the municipality will also implement an incubation center which will be oriented and focused to developing uh, services which will, which will benefit from uh, the municipalities and increasing its uh, revenues and uh, uh, the quality of its uh, public services. It will also mainstream women and youth empowerment through digitalization. This would be a triple win uh, value added partnership. It will employ, imply uh, partners uh, which can be governments, which can be private sector, business operators, academia, and also uh, universities, donors, and development partners. Such partnership will seek to uh, enhance mutual benefits of all parties, adding value to and maximizing the impact of uh, their actions. In fine, such initiative will contribute to advance sustainable development goals, namely uh, SDG 9, 17, and 11. But to some extent, it will also contribute to uh, SDG 5 and 8. Thank you for your kind attention. And once again, congratulations to the organizers for uh, having uh, set up this summit. Thank you very much. Uh, we invite the International Maritime Organization Ambassador uh, Dr. Ovidio Kupsha to share some words on the IMO and the innovation in maritime. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you, Christina, and the Maritime University for the opportunity to speak to this distinguished audience. As you know, IMO is a United Nations agency and the global ruler for the safety, security, and environment at sea. So IMO represents the voice of humanity concerning the global maritime issues. Uh, the organization was founded in 1958 and operates with conventions signed by the member states and uh, implemented by governments. The IMO key convention are SOLAS 1974, MARPOL 1973, and SDCW 1978. All IMO's rules have written these three conventions. Representing the voice of the humanity, the IMO responds to the great challenges of humankind. Through its rural, IMO imposes the innovation and the evolution of the maritime technology. The road ahead is usually as follows. Member states debate and decide in IMO's committees the new rules. The rules are implemented by the governments. The rules become mandatory for the industry. The industry mobilizes engineers and researchers in the process of innovation to comply the rules. And finally, the specialists create the technological innovation. This is the usual way. Uh, for example, MARPOL permanently imposes the maritime industry to upgrade naval engines and fuels in order to reduce carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, plastic and dangerous goods pollution. SOLAS, spur it to find new technologies in communication, safety, rescue, or fight against maritime disasters. STCW leads to developing of new professional standards and skills, new method of education and training, digitalization of the management, and so on. IMO is also constantly attentive to the feedback of the shipping industry and maritime community through the about 60 associated NGOs. The new technologies developed by the industry are adopted in order to global implement them. In this way, also IMO become a global promoter of the innovation. Today, the biggest challenge of the IMO, United Nations and all the maritime world is related to the 400,000 
seafarers having crew changes delayed. It is the most important humanitarian crisis at sea in our history, given that over 80% of food, medicines, equipment, or fuel are carried by ships. The very capacity of humanity to fight the pandemic depends on these people and on global shipping. Romania, as one of the main suppliers of seafarers, having an important infrastructure to the Black Sea, offshore and shipbuilding industry is an active member of IMO. The government, the maritime industry, the academic and training community actively comply with IMO rules, raising standards and implementing innovative technologies. We have to understand the future of our civilization is closely related to the future of the shipping industry. Further, I am going to remain a promoter of good practice and innovation and one of the most convincing voices of humanity. And I strongly believe this voice clearly tells us our future depends on our concern for the environment and for each human being living on our earth. Thank you very much. Further, we have an important intervention from the European Commission, uh, from the Director General for Research and Innovation, the Unit of Future Urban and Mobility Systems, uh, Ms. Juana Bodron. Bună dimineața, România. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to see that Romania is committed to um, uh, to achieve to a sustainable uh, to a sustainable goal, uh, and I'm happy to participate today here. Um, I will talk today from a, the Commission perspective. Uh, I see that the transport is at the heart of your discussion, but today I will approach. Uh, a, a more holistic, uh, uh, a more holistic concept, which and the transport is part of, part of it. Uh, this concept was developed by uh, 15 high-level um, experts across EU. But because I only have five minutes um, for this presentation, I will I will skip the introduction part. I will go slowly through the slides. Um, um, and we'll go in depth to, to the concept, to the proposal that these experts uh, have presented. I will stop only to the part on the smart, uh, smart city. So the, um, it's about Horizon Europe, the next uh, framework program uh, uh, with a focus on, on the missions uh, which have a societal impact. Uh, and today is, uh, I will talk about the mission on uh, climate neutral and smart cities. And I'm happy to see that other uh, cities around the world as Madagascar presented are focused on this, uh, on this aspect. These are the board members, uh, definitions. Um, I mean, we all know the, the figures around, uh, around Europe. Uh, um, but I, would, I wanted to see uh, we also contribute basically to the uh, sustainable uh, development goals uh, and to the European Green Deal, which um, aims at uh, achieving a climate neutral continent by 20, 2050. I think there was um, an issue on the uh, definition here on the smart cities. Uh, I think the, the main obstacle to climate transition today is not a lack of climate friendly and smart technologies, but the capacity to implement them. So when we think, I mean, the experts, when they conceive this concept of smart city, they are conceiving technologies and digital innovation uh, who are enabling basically the climate, um, uh, the climate, um, the climate goal with uh, full benefits to its, uh, to its citizens. Uh, the experts propose basically um, a concept to support a hundred European cities uh, in their uh, transformation towards climate neutrality. But now the goal is even more ambitious. Uh, it's not 2050, but it's 2030, which is tomorrow, basically. And it has at its heart the, the citizens. They also want to make out of these 100 cities an innovation hub so they could inspire all the other uh, cities. 
and you have the report here attached in the hyperlink. Uh, you, it's a 40 pages report. As you could see, it's not uh, necessarily something, something new uh, in terms of concept, but what this report brings, there are, they are bringing some, some novelties in, in it. And one is they are developing a new, uh, a new form of governance. They want to break down the slide, um, the silo-based uh, form of governance, the traditional one, with a new multi-level governance where, where all the stakeholders from academia, uh, businesses, uh, civil societies are part of this, uh, are this part of this concept. Uh, they give also a new role to citizens, a more active role. And they also propose that 1% of this mission to go through uh, citizens' actions uh, uh, on climate actions that they, uh, they, they could propose. It also, how this systemic approach could be delivered, they propose a, a climate city contract that will be signed by the mayor of the city together with the regional and national level, and of course with the commitment from the European Commission. They also give a new role, uh, a new role and new definition to the uh, innovation because uh, it's not only innovation in, in transport, but it's also innovation in governance. It's innovation at all the sectors, all the levels as the energy, the construction and the recycling, supported, of course, by powerful digital technologies. They also propose, uh, of course, um, the most difficult part is the financial part. Uh, it's not only uh, holistic, but uh, it wants to go, I'm working for research innovation, but this concept wants to go beyond research and innovation. So to uh, collect synergies with all the other uh, European funds, they propose a lending and blending facility for climate cities as a financial umbrella. They are proposing that up to 10% of the next multi-financial uh, framework to, uh, to be geared in climate action towards the objective of the climate cities mission. They want the structural funds to be part of this um, of this financing system. Uh, they propose also a one-stop shop uh, in the form of a platform run by the EIB offices in the member states. All the cities, all the 100 cities that will participate in, the, in this project, they will have a mission label, which basically will allow them a preferential uh, access to the technical support and to the available financial instruments. And of course, they, in terms of financing, they would like also green budgeting as a tool to benchmark uh, climate investments and to align public finance with environmental objectives. Uh, we've seen also that um, uh, international cooperation plays uh, uh, an important role. They also uh, seek to, to develop a global knowledge center on cities and climate that could facilitate and create synergies between the European and international climate initiative and stakeholders. Uh, and uh, these 100 cities that will uh, be part of the project need to be to inspire uh, uh, and to, to learn from uh, replicate ideas and solutions emerging from the mission. In terms of process and selection of how these uh, cities will be selected, ambition, commitment and citizens' inv involvement will be the main criteria with inclusiveness as an overarching principle taking into account a balanced geographical representation and different preparedness level. Because we all know cities in Europe and across the world, they are very different. The application process will include three steps of co-creation of the application, um, the co-implementation co co of this uh, city climate contract, and finally, the um, uh, the implementation at the very end with reporting, monitoring and valuation based on the methodology of the Covenant of Mayor, which is already used uh, by a great number of cities. And I will uh, close this <coughs> discussion with some of the examples uh, of citizens' engagement that we had across the across Europe in the last six months. And I'm happy to see uh, Romania again uh, on the list, but uh, we, together with other cities um, uh, who participated in this uh, democratic exercise. Um, on 22nd of September, this report, this uh, 15 high-level um, 
experts hand over um, this proposal to the Commission. And now it will be up to the Commission to see how this proposal will be translated into uh, concrete actions in the next framework program. Thank you for all your attention. We further invite Dr. Costel Stanca from Constanza Maritime Ports Administration, Romania, the General Director. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation for the uh, Constanza Maritime University. And it's a great honor for me to speak for this summit and to have the opportunity to share with you uh, some ideas about the Port of Constanza uh, as a future smart ports. Port of Constanza has the potential to become an energy hub by implementing a new strategy focused on energy, which is uh, both friendly with the environment and using digital tools. And um, uh, why Constanza Port? Constanza Port because we are a core port on TNT network. Our investments needs are always a priority both for Urban Commission and our government. It is connected with all modes of transport. And Constanza Port is, uh, has an important current capacity and still there is room for future developments, which is not in every port. Our projects are targeting besides the improvement of the presence of facilities, but also to create new territories with, with depths up to birth, with depths up to the 19 meters. The, the, the COVID uh, pandemic affected the maritime transports, but we, we can say that uh, even the last year was uh, the, the maximum volume of uh, operation Rated ever in our ports, uh, we are now only with 6-7% less than previous year for the first eight months. The port of Constanza already started the procedure to have the updating of the master plan and uh, practically we will have a new master plan coming with projects implementing, to be implemented up to 2050. And uh, here we have a lot of projects with uh, related to infrastructure of Constanza Port and access of the European funds for the superstructure, which will be open for the potential investors. How Constanza Port will become, uh, in, will be in line with the Green Deal objectives. We will be part of uh, uh, those who will encourage the circular economy and that we will do in our port area and also we'll introduce smart energetic system with the support of digitalization. Hydrogen is an alternative fuel, which is a part of, of the Green Deal. And on 8th July this year, European Commission launched the European Clean Hydrogen Islands. Now, this is the new hit at the European Commission level and will be the new vector of energetic system. And the Port of Constanza was selected to be, to be part of this alliance, and we will be actively involved in, in this initiative. And hydrogen, as you know, is very versatile from the energy and form of energy, and has a potential to be used in many areas, including, of course, the, the, the port activities. We, we intend, as a Port of Constanza, we intend to become a focal point of European energetic system. And now we're just preparing to develop new peers like, are in, like you see in the picture, peers three and four, which will, will, uh, will uh, involve an investment of 500 million euros with two, 200 new hectares and 15 depths deep depth bears up to 19 meters. We'll, Constanza Port is also invited to be part in European project Ealing, which is financed by CHEF program. And there we have many objectives related to called ironing concept in ports. The, the project, it is in line, of course, with the Green Deal policy and will be finished in 2022. The onshore power supply is one of the strategies recommended by World Sport Climate Initiative for in renounce, reducing the, the environmental impact of seagoing vessels in ports and also a part of European Commission green policy. 
and Constanza port will be one of the ports implementing the OPS at this called ironing project. As a conclusion, constant support could play a crucial role both for the European energetic and transport system, which now are seen in developing together. Our organization is devoted, devoted to the idea to exploit Port of Constanza potential and become not just a transport hub, but also an energetic hub. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to make a few remarks during the Smart Transport Summit from the position of Wist International and from our company, Dodotheo Maritime. A quick word about WISTA, the Women's International Shipping and Trading Association. This is a global association now formally recognized as one of the leading bodies helping our industry adapt to the modern world of diversity and equality. We work with many other organizations and large companies in supporting these goals, as well as encouraging women to achieve their potential in this industry. Our own goals are very much in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goal number five in empowering women and encouraging gender equality for the benefit of all. My company, Dodotheo Maritime, is a drive behind sustainable digital development for shipping companies. As a family-run organization with a deep tradition in the industry, we pride ourselves on working collaboratively and conscientiously as we help our partners with their digitalization and transformation. But how do we perceive the future of smart transport? When we look at smart transport, we do so seeking to encourage the engagement of everyone possible in the discussion. The idea of leaving no one behind refers to making sure we understand all the ways we can move forward, but also how all the stakeholders can be impacted. And we point to the ability to address those issues with the right technologies and tools and to forge ahead collaboratively. But an important question is how do we define smart? From a transport perspective, are we building smart networks that are correctly programmed or through sophisticated arrangements capable of being adaptive? The answer, you will say, is yes. And this is what, for example, ship managers have set out to do. Use digital ship, ship management tools to enable smoother fleet operations. Shipping looks at ways to create efficiencies and these in turn create collaborative opportunities, but also find ways to reduce the impact on the climate and the oceans. As we move transport through this transformation to sustainability, and my focus personally is on maritime transport, we need to be intelligent as well as smart. We need to use everything at our disposal to make intelligence an inbuilt aspect of a smart network. And at the same time, to focus on the pillars of sustainability. First and foremost, people and the planet, and of course, being more pragmatic, also on profit, because it needs to make financial sense for the industry to buy. In. One could say that intelligence is an ability to answer or solve a problem in a different way, from a different perspective, and with perhaps other resources. We cannot build smart if we use the same tools all the time, especially those tools we now know are failing us. We cannot build smart if we fail to try new ideas and new thinking. And this is of course why I believe diversity is the answer. Diversity is about bringing as many ideas to a table as possible, whether it is programming the algorithms that build smart systems or finding new ways to build business relationships or solving logistics problems. Diversity is about listening to all the voices without prejudice, finding a solution, realizing there are a lot more ideas out there and also a lot more needs. This is one of the roles of WISTA. But also as we build smart transport systems, we have to ensure 
we have the right tools to gain a holistic image of the impacts of our moves towards our goals. Diversity is about inclusion, and here it enables us to see if obstacles exist or where the best solutions can be found. We want smart transport to be applicable for everyone. Therefore, it has to be developed with the skills available from all corners of society. And that is what we have been doing with WISTA and some of our projects helping companies and other maritime institutions understand what that means. Hence, our obvious focus on SDG number five, but also on 10 and 17, creating stronger institutions, as well as do all we can to create equality and remove prejudice. So we need to think outside the box and be open to new ideas, different perspectives and new ways of doing things. And where do we get all of these? By looking towards absolutely everyone, of course. By looking, at, uh, by looking at every person that can bring that value to the table. That is how we will achieve diversity and inclusion, but also how we will, we will achieve innovation and sustainability. So there's my short input to this discussion and smart transport from both the digitalization perspective and from the diversity and equality point of view as we seek to move forward with sustainability. I wish you every success in the summit's deliberations. Thank you. We are working on uh, mobility on, on transport topics uh, in general, just because the transport uh, is very important link and maybe it's the biggest link between a region, a city and an airport where it's located. And um, we, I just uh, had a couple of uh, studies on the next slide, uh, if you're interested more. And answering your question, how the ARC perceives the future of um, smart transport and smart mobility, it's of course mobility as a service. But when we are talking about mobility and uh, smart mobility at airport uh, regions, we have to take into account uh, a lot of things. And here, the best example will be our last project on the next, next slide. Uh, it's called uh, Leira and it was financed by Interreg Central Europe. And um, here we had to take a lot of things into account like electric mobility, air rail links, uh, soft mobility as walking and cycling. And of course, public transport wayfinding, just uh, because when we are, when we really wanna move, uh, when we really wanna be smart at airport, areas, uh, we have to take all of the aspects into consideration because when, um, when we are talking about mobility at the airport, we cannot just uh, think about passengers. We also have to think about uh, people who live around and who work at the airports. And that's why the Mobility topic is so much linked and so much important for sustainable development of the regions and cities and for airport regions and cities. Because yes, it includes quality of education, it's um, economic growth and it's environment. And uh, why uh, I would like to link this project and our work, what we're doing, with uh, the EU Green Deal. It's because one of the elements of the Green Deal is the uh, link between airport, communities living around the airport, the, um, the authorities who are around the areas. So they, can, they, they have to work together in order to reach this goal of smart mobility and airport alone or a region or a city alone cannot uh, make it, unfortunately. So 
this is my presentation and uh, thank you very much. Hello everybody. Thank you for, uh, for being here, first of all. And because the time is uh, short, I will go directly into the subject uh, regarding sustainable navigation. And if we refer to, to drivers for sustainable navigation, we may say that uh, global trade and subsequently seaborne trade are driven uh, by the global economy. Maritime transportation, the vehicle of a large part of the worldwide fluxes of goods, is at the heart of the globalization phenomenon. Products these days are often assembled with the help of supply chains spanning the world. Even simple products can travel around the world. A particular step in the chain involves manual labor that is sourced from a particular country where this is relatively inexpensive. In all this, uh, the maritime transportation sector is the key player and the fact that, that more goods seem to undergo more and more transport in itself as unsustainable by a part of the public. Sustainable transportation should not endanger public health or ecosystems and should meet mobility needs consistent with the use of renewable resources at below their rates of regeneration and the use of non-renewable resources at below the rates of development of renewable substitutes. A number of initiatives, as uh, we may say that the green ships approaches, are currently taken at various management levels as international organizations, states, industry and ship owners to significantly reduce environmental impacts and to ensure a greater degree of sustainability for the shipping industry. These approaches require global views on sustainability of all stages of a ship cycle as design, construction, operation and maintenance and recycling. I will outline briefly some considerations for each of them. For example, for design, we can look at the elements that improve fuel efficiency and the use of renewable fuel sources. If we uh, speak about elements that reduce harmful air and water emissions or elements that facilitate sustainable shoreside operations like solid and, bulk, uh, solid and liquid waste handling or shoreside power. If we look in construction, we can say that we use sustainable materials as green solvents, lubricants uh, and environmentally friendly hull coatings equipment or practices that minimize or eliminate the use of non-renewable resources during construction. <clears throat> if we look at operation and the maintenance, we see that uh, we look at fuel efficiency, emission reductions and the ballast water management. For recycling, we speak about management of hazardous materials practices and use of equipment and materials that minimize or eliminate environmental that releases during recycling. For each phase of the ship's design life, it is important to facilitate improved efficiencies to reduce the environmental impacts and to contribute to overall sustainability. If we look at the smart navigation devices, <clears throat> A sustainable navigation effort in improving the navigational safety is the electronic navigation, which is about getting the ship safely, securely, and efficiently from birth to birth in an environmentally friendly way using globally enhanced systems for navigation and communication, having the human element in focus. So one of one important technology supporting the advent of electronic navigation is the VHF data exchange system which is the next generation of EIS. This VHF data exchange system is seen as an effective and efficient use of radio spectrum, building on the capability of AIS and addressing the increasing requirements for data through the system. The first attempt towards the digitalization of maritime transportation was the introduction of the EIS. The main goal of EIS was enabling a type of broadcast communication in which vessels periodically report their position, course, and speed to avoid the collisions. Since the introduction of the AIS, new application services have arisen. Among others, AIS <clears throat> is nowadays also used for aids to navigation, search and rescue, and fleet monitoring. 
the growth of the IS has been such that in some of the most crowded waters, the system is of today already overloaded, giving the danger to the IS main mission, collision avoidance, that this overloaded can represent the International Association of Maritime Aids to Navigation Lighthouse Authorities, the YALA, and the number of national maritime authorities started to work on the VHF data exchange system. Rather than an evolution of AIS, PDS is a communication system encompassing different communication subsystems, but one of them is the AIS, which you already mentioned until now. We can conclude that the maritime community is seeking for new possibilities and, cap and capacities towards digital communications, since the users are on globally distributed ships and often time far beyond the horizon, a hybrid solutions or of a terrestrial and satellite-based transmission scheme addresses the challenge for reaching all users. In the end, I want to thank you very much that I am, I was, and I am a speaker in this Smart Transport Summit. Thank you very much. Further, we invite uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Maria Carrera from World Maritime University. She is a research associate and she will discuss about synergies between modes of transport and the human element. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you, um, Christina, for um, your kind invitation to participate uh, in this interesting event. So in terms uh, of agenda, I'm going to uh, provide a very short uh, description of the uh, main components uh, of uh, smart transport. Uh, I will describe uh, briefly some challenges and opportunities um, for uh, having humans in the loop. And immediately after, I will describe um, also uh, briefly um, a project and uh, EU funded project uh, called uh, Safe Mode. Um, uh, as an example uh, of uh, WMU's uh, research uh, efforts on uh, global partnership and uh, cooperation. So, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Cristina. Uh, so, um, probably a good uh, way of uh, describing what uh, smart transport is, is uh, by its components, its main uh, components that include the uh, organization, technology, and the uh, humans in the loop. So um, um, the human technology uh, organization uh, interaction creates uh, systems uh, in understanding in risk and um, complex socio-technical uh, systems such as smart transport can be considered. Um, for the element uh, uh, organization, there would be like uh, two levels, a uh, low level that uh, would uh, refer to um, individuals in their uh, systems uh, and uh, operating. Um, the high level would uh, include uh, mainly uh, supervision and uh, regulatory and policy aspects. The element uh, technology would also uh, include like two uh, levels. Uh, the level uh, of uh, how uh, people uh, interact with machinery, machines in general, and another level that uh, would refer to uh, the use of uh, tools to support uh, decision uh, making. Um, for humans in the loop, um, we can uh, move to the next slide, Christina. Um, uh, we can think that uh, we can uh, state that um, uh, Smart transport can benefit uh, from the unique capabilities of uh, human beings uh, by preserving the human strengths, by eliminating or integrating uh, limitations of people, and by making sure that the uh, smart transport is not a uh, cognitive uh, distraction. So um, uh, we can um, uh, use human factors effectively in the smart transport by integrating technologies with uh, the human element, by supporting designers in their uh, trade of uh, challenges, and by ensuring operators and effective uh, support. These are uh, main aspects of um, uh, a safe mode uh, project. Thank you, Christina. Uh, a three-year uh, European Union uh, funded uh, project. Uh, we are now uh, through halfway uh, the project. And this um, uh, project aims to uh, strengthen the synergies between maritime and aviation in the field uh, of human uh, factors. Um, it's composed uh, of a big uh, consortium um, with uh, core um, partners, including um, 
academia, eh, research centers, eh, industry, NGOs. Um, there are also uh, users involved, uh, including airlines and shipping companies. There are international partners as well from Russia, China, Indonesia, Philippines, and we have also a big industrial uh, advisory board. The same uh, project um, um, recognizes um, business line. Uh, recognizes the, the crucial role of uh, human operators for safe and uh, efficient uh, shipping and um, aviation and uh, the impacts of uh, human factors in safety and um, uh, efficiency um, are evolving uh, clearly and uh, will become even more prominent uh, in the future uh, because of uh, different resources, including, among others, increasing automation, remotely operated uh, uh, ships and aircrafts, but these challenges are transforming the human-machine interface uh, in all uh, modes of transport and uh, probably uh, introduce new and uh, not even a uh, non-risk uh, zone. So uh, for the uh, project, um, uh, main, uh, project, main problems uh, include the scarcity of good uh, human factors data coming from investigation or safety events and the lack of effective feedback loops from uh, operators back to uh, designers. So uh, then Safe Mode uh, project aims to uh, assist designers um, who are not uh, usually human factors experts with the development uh, of uh, a human uh, risk informed design to inform them with um, key relevant and practical information uh, and uh, tools. So, uh, in terms of some uh, main uh, outcomes we are uh, working on uh, at the moment, this uh, would include uh, the development of an open data uh, based uh, repository called SHIELD that uh, will um, include uh, all this information we are collecting about the human factors, the tools, best practices, techniques we are developing, and this um, uh, database will, um, uh, will uh, keep uh, open after the once the, the project uh, finishes. We are also developing, you can uh, move to the final, um, yeah, you want, thank you, Christina. We are also developing a, a, the a human risk informed design um, framework as uh, previously described. And uh, finally, we are also, one of uh, our main um, outcomes include the development of a just culture framework for my time in aviation as a kind of a tool also to create the right atmosphere uh, to support uh, um, uh, operators to uh, report about incidents, incidents and near misses. So um, we have conducted a, a systematic uh, stakeholder analysis to identify primary stakeholders as a first step to institutionalize some of these uh, main outcomes. This is the main contribution of the World Maritime University to this uh, project. And um, uh, we have identified uh, primary holders uh, from uh, private uh, and uh, public uh, sector, uh, from civil society and uh, academia. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, you have my contact details there. And thank you for this opportunity. If you look at the development goals, we have, we have talked about this, and, and fuel consumption and uh, climate action is, of course, very important here. But we should not underestimate the role of shipping in the, the big transport infrastructure in the system, in our world system, and also actually in, in cities. It was mentioned smart cities, but urban waterways is a much underutilized resource that we should have a, a much closer look at in the future, I think. However, I will mostly talk about uh, merchant shipping and transport, uh, cargo transport. And as we have seen before, um, ships are by far the most, one of the most energy efficient uh, transport modes. This is important, of course, to reduce um, uh, emissions of carbon. But if we go to new fuels, the price of the fuel will likely go up. And again, the reduction of energy consumption will be uh, much more important than today. This applies to hydrogen or ammonia or other fuels. So a lot of people talk about electrification of road transport as, as a solution to, to cargo uh, emissions going down, but energy will still be high for cargo for road transport. But the problem we are facing with ships is, of course, that they are less flexible. It takes a longer time. Uh, the frequency is lower and so on and so forth. But what we are looking at 
to here in Norway and other places is perhaps to, to look at smaller ships with higher frequencies, more differentiated speeds and stuff like that to make the transport system much more flexible than today. This could uh, contribute very much to increasing the compet uh, competitiveness of maritime transport. And then we are talking about, uh, or we are coming very rapidly into what we call uncrewed or unmanned ships. If you remove the accommodation section, uh, you can uh, remove safety systems and stuff like that. And the operational cost will also be much lower if you go for smaller and more ships. So th this is an essential uh, part in enabling these new transport systems. And this is going on as we speak, both in inland waterways, there are several projects looking at smaller, uh, lower manning and unmanned uh, ships. Uh, short distance road transport in Norway, we have two commercial projects going on, and also in other types of transport uh, for aquaculture and also for service uh, vessels like tugs. Uh, these are all small vessels, but you can use the same argument on the big intercontinental uh, liners. Uh, the container ships have become bigger and bigger up to now more than 20,000 TEUs, and this is not uh, very good logistic systems, and it's not really resilient either. Maybe we also should look at smaller, uh, more ships, more frequent uh, transports and things like that. And as we have seen in COVID, we can get away with removing persons traveling around the world, but we still need cargo. So, so this is uh, something we really have to look at. When will it happen? It has already. Uh, this is a launch platform for the sea launch uh, project. It's uh, certified as a ship flagged in uh, Liberia, classed by the GL. And this is, has been operating fully unmanned during the launch phase in intercontinental water, international waters. So, so this is already going on, actually. And it, it is proof that you can do this. Uh, from uh, 2012 to 2015, uh, the EU um, financed the first bigger investiga investigation into concepts uh, related to unmanned uh, cargo transport. Uh, this was more or less the, the modern uh, starting point for this interest. And as I said, in Norway, we now have two commercial projects. One is the Arabic land that you may have heard about. And the other is uh, a wholesale retailer project where they want to ferry uh, cargo across the fjord in Norway. And that will also be um, eventually unmanned. There are also several EU projects. I'm mentioning two that we are involved in. Autoship, which is going to demonstrate the one inland uh, waterway case in Belgium and one uh, bulk transport case on the Norwegian coast down to uh, Denmark. And with a budget of uh, close to 30 million euros, uh, it's a fairly big uh, investment into this new technology. There are also several other projects uh, looking at this. Uh, we are, I would say, Norway is uh, quite far advanced and Europe in general. As of today, I, I think Europe uh, is the leading uh, region for this type of research, but uh, Singapore, Korea, Japan, China is all the way also investing huge amounts of money into this uh, area. So we really need to keep the speed up, not necessarily to, to, uh, to win uh, the game, but uh, to uh, be a major player in this uh, development. So to conclude, uncrewed ships, I think is going to be very important to, to make the future uh, more resilient and more uh, sustainable transport systems in the world, uh, both uh, intercontinental, short sea, and also in uh, urban settings and uh, otherwise. Autonomy is not the goal of this, it's the means. If we want to have many small ships, we really have to address the, the crew cost and also to get the cost of construction down. Europe has a leading position as of today, but Asia is heavily investing in this, and this is something we really need to keep uh, at full speed in uh, Europe. And if you want more information, we have a Norwegian forum for autonomous ships that you can uh, look up also uh, with international pages and also an international network for autonomous ships with uh, some resources on the internet. So thank you.
We further invite Ms. Professor Dr. Angelica Bailon. She is the International Relations President of the Maritime Academy of Asia and Pacific from Philippines. Respectful greetings. Thank you for the invitation. I am Dr. Angelica Bailon, the Director of Maritime Academy of Asia and the Pacific. I was also the research partner of Constanta Maritime University with Dr. Christina uh, Dragomir, uh, the uh, prolific researcher, project leader of uh, JECAMET project. And timely that uh, we just finished another IAMU funded project that is sustainable development in maritime education and training project. We'll, this is led by World Maritime University with me as one of the research partners. Um, so to, for today, uh, allow me to share with you the Philippine Smart Transport System in cooperation with Korea and um, in reference to SDMET and JECAMET projects as model or framework. Manila is the capital of the Philippines and a, stu a study from JICA showed that the Philippines is losing 3.5 billion pesos a day due to the worsening condition traffic condition in Metro Manila. Among the reasons cited are the increasing number of private schools, rather private vehicles, uh, the uh, inadequate road infrastructures. Okay, so this slide shows the, uh, the reason on um, why uh, there is worsening traffic condition in Manila. Uh, based on the JICA study, because of the increasing number of private vehicles, the inadequate road infrastructure, the lack of efficient public transportation vehicles, and Metro Manila is home to more than 15 million people. As a solution, uh, the Philippines, through the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, collaborated with South Korea, Seoul Metropolitan Government, for the adoption of an intelligent transport system that uses modern technology to deal with traffic, flood control, and urban planning and renewal in Metro Manila. Korea uses Transportation Operation and Information Service, or TOPUS. TOPIS. This is an integrated traffic management facility that operates and manages sole traffic flow because it gathers a wide range of traffic information from bus management system, current traffic situation, from the transport card system, and other sources. Hence, real-time information are processed, and the data are used to help map out alternative routes that schedules travels and departures. Next slide, please. Now, how smart transport system contributes to sustainable development goals? The smart transport system is an IT system applied in the field of road transportation and interfaces with other modes of transportation, thereby contributing to SDG 9, and it creates a smart mega Manila. Seoul city government provides IT expertise for system implementation, therefore contributing to SDG 17. The contactless payment cards as a mode of fair payment contributes to SDG 3 on good health and well-being that prevents contact of COVID-19. Installation of smart bus peripherals, smart loading and unloading station, and smart bus terminals contributes to SDG 9 and SDG 11. The smart traffic operation procedure contributes to SDG 12 and the responsible, um, rather the road safety and traffic education in the Philippine school and local system contributes to SDG 4. Next slide, please. Using JECAMET and SDMET um, as a framework for a smart transport system, the JECAMET study does not only tackle SDG 5, but it tackles all SDGs, um, considering the principle of uh, empowerment, inclusivity, and um, gen gender sensitivity. Otherwise, all SDG 5s would be partially accomplished without women, from SDG 1, No Poverty, to SDG 17 on Global Partnership. On SDMET, we acknowledge that MET system is comprised of, se of several interrelated systems, the transport system that need to be transformed into a smart transport system for sustainability. So let me summarize using the acronyms SDMET for easy recall on how the SDMET could further contribute 
to the Smart Transport System for Sustainability. S stands for Supervised Campus by Institutionalizing Sustainable Development. D stands for Development of Men and Women for Sustainability Roles. I stands for Incentivize or Provide Incentives. M stands for Mix Incorporate SD Principles. E stands for Execute Sustainability Initiatives. And T stands for Train People on Sustainability. Next slide, please. Finally, it can be surmised that indeed, the smart transport system would undoubtedly benefit the three Ps. That's the people, the planet, for resulting to more profit, thus contributing to the accomplishment of the sustainable development goals for peace and prosperity. On behalf of Mao Philippines and Paepi Global, our congratulations to the organizers of the Smart Transport Summit, Romania, towards the accomplishment of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Dr. Angelica Bailon from Maritime Academy of Asia and Pacific Philippines. We further invite Ms. Adriana Barbasiewicz from Navaship Design, Poland. She is the head of 3D scanning and photogrammetry, and she will discuss about new technologies in smart transport. Um, hello, everyone. So, as uh, Christina said, my name is Adrian Berbashevich. Um, I'd like to present you a short presentation, but the title is a little bit different because I was thinking a lot about the title and sustainable development goals and new technologies. And I realized that uh, the, every change that we want to see in the world and we want to do, uh, it really starts within ourselves. So I'd like to show you how we can implement a sustainable development goals in a company with successful. So on the next slide, please. Yeah, so as I said, I'm a head of 3D scanning and photogrammetry department in Navaship Design Office. Um, NAVA is a leading ship design office located in Gdańsk, Poland, and we are employing uh, high skills uh, specialists with extensive exper experience in variety of fields. And uh, today, with over 25 years of experience, we are one of the most rapidly developing enterprises in Poland, and it's according to Forbes magazine, so I think it's true. Uh, and operating globally and sticking to short response time is our main goal. And we achieve it by combining technical expertise with a practical grasp of technology. So basically, whatever we do, we put all of our hearts into it. So next slide. And uh, nowadays, we are focusing on smart transport development. And certainly, the autonomous vessels are going to cause significant changes uh, to marine industry. Uh, they could be safer, for instance, by reducing the need of crew members. They could be more efficient and environmental friendly. And of course, we can only imagine other uh, advantages of those vessels. And I know that uh, one of the speakers told uh, to us a lot of advantages of those vessels. But I'd like to focus on different aspects of the type of vessel, uh, because at the same time, we need to overcome a few challenges, such as reducing employment of the ship crew all over the world. Uh, basically, very often those crew members are from developing countries and they are employed in lower positions. So what we could do to avoid increasing unemployment? Uh, in case of mal malfunction of vessel systems, there's no possibility to, for manual repairs. So how the support should look like to avoid destruction of the ship? And I'd like to say something more about uh, point five. So vessels vulnerability to hacking attacks. And just imagine that you are an owner of the small autonomous container vessel and someone had hacked your system and just kidnapped your vessel. So what you should do with that? And in my opinion, we all should try to find answers for those doubts. Uh, and create a new doubts because we need to all, we need to remember that with all with great breakthroughs might come also uh, come big dangerous. Um, so next slide, please. So because I'm a head of uh, scanning department, I really needed to mention something about that. Uh, so basically we are starting all of our project with uh, 3D scanning. 
And with scanners, we can uh, map the environment, so we can capture all the required data. We can recreate almost everything using point clouds. And uh, right now, what's the biggest uh, challenge? Uh, worldwide travel restriction caused by COVID-19. So we cannot go freely to vessels all over the world uh, because 3D laser scanning is still a part of design work that needs to be done with the right person with right and equipment. So uh, we are starting to cooperate with uh, companies all over the world and a few of them are mentioned in the slide and I really rec recommend those companies. And because of the situation right now, our main goal as a company and my main goal is to create 3D scanning alliance, which will bring together companies from all over the world and clearly define the quality of work performed. Uh, and I think that it, it will help to, to work globally, uh, being in, in the office, to be honest. And uh, now you can see uh, our latest projects. It's the crew transfer vessel. It might be used uh, for operational wind farms and our designers put a lot of knowledge and heart to create a high effective and environmental friendly uh, catamaran. And what's it's more important, the vessel meets the requirements of IMO and it can easily be used in emission control areas in North American and US Caribbean Sea and North and Baltic Sea. Uh, basically we have a design and our next step, steps of developing our model tests in towing a uh, tank and also obtaining an approval in principle from class. Okay, so next slide, please. And now I say something about our uh, designs. Uh, so right now we are doing a lot of ballast water treatment systems um, as required by IMO and the relevant authorities in the USA. Uh, it actively removes fills or neutralize organism prior to discharge. So it sounds very terrible, but thanks to that, we can avoid the mixing of ecosystems uh, uh, from the two ends of the world, uh, which can cause species extinction. So it's uh, really helpful. And uh, we as a company, we can offer complex services from 3D laser scanning through the designing and supervision during installation on board. And right now we've done more than 120 Bias water treatment systems projects and still counting. So we have a lot of experience in that. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to say something about women, gender equality, and economic growth, decent work. So here you can uh, see a few graphs. And unfortunately, uh, because of the COVID-19 and a uh, little bit crisis in maritime industry, uh, it's caused a reduction of employment, but I'm sure that numbers from 2019 would be better to show, but we can face it right now, we should face it. So women are almost 40% of employees in NAVA and two departments, uh, my department and sales department uh, is uh, are managing by women uh, and the average salary of the women is lower than uh, average salary in the company, but it's still growing. Um, and what can I say? We are we are old company with very young people because the average age uh, in our company is uh, 35 years. We are hiring lots of young people because we we are believing uh, we, and we are we love to teach uh, younger people. And so what's more important about those numbers? Those are only numbers. And my com my company uh, Nava uh, cares a lot of people and equality and gives changes for developing. And I think that I'm the best uh, example of that because I'm 27 years old, land surveyor, uh, running, running 3D scanning department for more than a year in marine uh, company. So I think that it shows how we uh, want to develop our employees. And thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so today I would like to introduce uh, inland ports as enablers of green logistics. Uh, this is especially important uh, within the European Green Deal and the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I'm also going to be talking about uh, smart cities and also the role of inland waterways. And this was already mentioned uh, by a previous speaker. Um, so it's already a good introduction here. I know we've been focusing a lot on maritime, which is very important, but I would like to show uh, a small other angle. 
so quickly about us. Um, AFIP represents over 200 inland ports all across Europe. Um, and at the same time, we also cover all of uh, Europe's different waterways. We are a very uh, wide organization, um, but we are small and we make sure that our voice is heard very well. Uh, I myself am uh, the director of AFIP now for over two years and having worked in European transport policy for uh, many years since then. Um, before I start, let me introduce to you quickly the concept of an inland port for those of you who are unfamiliar. Here are some very old examples. Inland ports have always made up a part of the core of European transport being in its major cities. Think about places like Brussels, Paris, um, Budapest, Vienna, all of these cities have developed around their waterway cores and have therefore always adapted to the needs in trade and transport. Today, uh, the inland port is a hub for multimodality. So it brings together all the forms of transport, but in particular, the cleanest forms, which are inland waterway transport and rail. Uh, so the role of an inland port is to optimize these in the best possible way and to make it attractive for businesses to operate in those ports so that they can be the uh, most sustainable businesses as they can be. You see some images here of an example in Belgium of the Trilogiepoor, where you can see inland waterways quickly uh, being connected to rail, which you, allows you to switch uh, between the different modes. Uh, at the same time, because inland ports are located within urban areas, we are able to play an important role within city logistics. So you have to imagine an inland vessel coming in with containers, bringing this to the local distribution site, which can then be um, uh, spread out across an entire urban area. There are many examples of this in Paris, in Brussels, in Vienna, all of these uh, types of systems in which we try and uh, both combat congestion, but also improve air quality. At the same time, the ports are also developing themselves into hubs of green energy. This can be hydrogen, this can be electric or any combination of these various fuels to make sure that um, we are moving towards the, more, the most sustainable direction that we can. Um, at the same time, we also look beyond our own cities and our own borders. Uh, so we try and work together to maximize the logistics possibilities um, in a region. So on the left, you can see an image of the Rhone ports. These are the ports between Lyon all the way to Marseille, where we are optimizing systems of transport between these two major urban hubs, and at the same time developing uh, a hydrogen electric system that will allow for clean inland shipping while also having the rail segment working at, at the same time in a parallel way. Um, when we look at the Danube across there, many countries are working together to um, open up the so far untapped potential of the Danube inland waterway transport to go all the way from the core of Germany to uh, Constanza uh, as a large link throughout Europe. But all of this also requires added infrastructure. And I don't only mean hard infrastructure, I'm also talking about um, digital infrastructure. Uh, it has already been mentioned, uh, autonomous vessels um, and smart planning. And this project here, RPIS, which is in the Upper Rhine, which is from Switzerland up until uh, Mannheim, is a system where we're already trying to bring together various companies and using dig different digital formats to maximize uh, efficiencies. So what this, for instance, already does this system, it allows for companies to plan their calls at ports in advance so that they can plan the connecting route almost immediately. So they have less downtime. At the same time, the system allows you to um, already do your customs declarations and already do other administrative things that you might have to do on this stretch of water. What they are going to be adding now is functionality for multimodality so that you can um, already link your planning for your inland vessel to the planning of your rail leg. And at the same time, also already experimenting with different uh, systems that will allow autonomous transport on this stretch of the river. In all of these different ways, 
uh, we as Inland Ports are trying to participate and contribute to the sustainable development goals and to reach the most um, green transport that we can for all of Europe. And that was quickly my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fiorito from the European <coughs> Federation of Inland Ports. We further invite Dr. Delia Dimitri from Connected Places Catapult United Kingdom. She is the Associate Director and she will talk about challenges of decarbonization, smart transport and mobility. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Delia Dimitriou, I'm Romanian and I'm extremely proud about the format of this event. It's for the first time that experts talk to experts. So I congratulate the uh, organizers and thank you for inviting me um, although the presentation will have only five minutes, the topic is the challenge of decarbonization. I'm a climate change expert and um, the role of innovations in smart uh, transport and particularly in mobility, talking about uh, uh, innovations in uh, cities and smart cities. These smart cities will be also smart uh, port cities or airport cities. Next, please. So uh, I am uh, uh, part of the Catapult family, which is a, a very clever uh, framework developed by UK government, Innovate UK, to link uh, research to innovations, scaling up to demonstrators, and then going to the market and creating jobs. We have nine catapults in um, UK, and my catapult is Connected Places Catapult, which means exactly transport, mobility, and cities. Next, please. So, so far, we've talked a lot in this event and some other events about smart transport and transport needs to be smarter and smarter to be uh, more efficient, to be greener, to be integrated. And of course, digital and uh, transport is a service. So it needs to uh, offer more and more services to uh, citizens, to cargo, freight, but also to be decarbonized because this is the real challenge of transport and we have to keep in mind no matter what actions are we doing. My presentation will not engage renewable energy sources, but will show how innovations being integrated, being linked together, being smartly used by policymakers, by um, decision make makers at the level of uh, transport authorities may help the decarbonization agenda. Next, please. So I have uh, given here some example of projects um, related to uh, smart transport from UK. Uh, the focus is, uh, focus is definitely on innovations. We need to uh, work more on micro mobility, particularly in UK, we are not like in the Netherlands having uh, bicycle lines and uh, now the government is working more and more uh, about this um, approach to infrastructure. We have started to use more and more transport data. Active travel is something particular now during COVID-19 uh, period, unfortunate period, um, very uh, focused and, and promoted from the government level. We have, uh, we are using open data for uh, bus services, for railway services, but mainly we go beyond the um, zero emissions vehicles. So integrated transport and, and uh, innovations will go beyond the vehicle or, or the infrastructure. However, to talk about the decarbonization agenda and here uh, I will uh, tackle some of the um, sustainable uh, development goals. Um, we have to tackle energy innovations, industry cities in my presentation, definitely climate change and um, integrated goals, so five goals. I, I will come back to, to this by the end of my presentation. Next one, please. So how is transport impacting um, climate change in UK? The, the graph is uh, from UK, and you can see that as part of uh, transport sector being integrated in um, UK economy, we have 27% contribution unfortunately, and the data are from uh, 2019. In, at European level, we are talking about 22, 23%. Uh, Out of this, 
uh, talking about uh, transport per sectors, uh, road transport is the most responsible one, as you can see, and out of ra road transport, we have 61% passenger cars. So we need to do something on this. So that's why intelligent mobility and integrated transport will come more and more with this uh, share mobility, um, uh, smart and um, ring to ride mobility. Unfortunately, right now, during this period, we cannot implement some very clever ideas and results of our projects. We are waiting for a better time. Hopefully in six months, we can um, assess uh, the implementation of shared mobility in, in Manchester. By the way, I live in Manchester in the north of UK and you will see at one of my slides. Next, please. So using artificial intelligence, now it's not uh, um, history, it's uh, present and definitely in future more and more will use it. This needs to be done in an inclusive transport system. We need to use it cleverly also by um, end users, by passengers. Uh, this uh, artificial intelligence will uh, help um, the congestion um, part Particular, I, I give here an, an example of reducing park, uh, parking congestion, but also right now improving ambulance responses time. Next, please. So more and more transport is, is uh, going to the digital era. But if we forget about decarbonization transport and we, if we don't use this measure smart, we will lose a lot because transport is responsible for climate change and transport needs to integrate several um, sustainable development goals to achieve uh, this goal. To, de to be decarbonized, we have uh, an ambition of uh, net zero carbon by 2050. By 2040, in fact, in UK, we have zero to carbon uh, in transport. So 10 years earlier. Um, this slide presents successful stories, different projects that I just uh, mentioned them, for instance, on-demand transport in Liverpool, e-cargo bike, tra um, it's more and more used for uh, last mile uh, freight, particularly now in cities. The future of transport is urban air mobility. We still don't know if this will be used for passenger as well, but definitely for uh, health services. And we have several projects on share self-driving uh, in London and in different other cities. Next, please. I give you an example from my city, uh, uh, ITS in Manchester, uh, using modernization agents every year for the last five years. minibuses, uh, mobility as, uh, as a service being the center of uh, decarbonization agenda, um, and uh, Internet of Things as a global city demonstrator was one of the projects with um, extremely successful when we try to implement. We have uh, a large area in the north because I'm talking about Manchester and Greater uh, Manchester, so 10 combined authorities around Manchester and in terms of transport, the integration is transport for Greater Manchester. So the strategy is from Manchester towards the uh, a large area around. Next, please. So this is the conclusion. We need to see the uh, benefit of innovations when we don't have uh, um, opportunities to implement renewable energy sources uh, for vehicle or for infrastructure or for the service. What will be these um, uh, benefits? Definitely ITS, mass, share mobility, using big data. What we need to do is to integrate the transport and to talk about low carbon integrated mobility. And here, every part of this integration will have its own role. And in terms of um, sustainability goals, definitely the smart transport will come with, mainly with electric vehicles. Uh, so goal number nine is here, innovations quite a lot. Uh, goal number seven, sorry, energy innovation nine, 11 cities. I talk here and examples to decarbonize transport will start from cities. Climate change 
goal 13, and definitely 17 to integrate uh, everything. So far, uh, next please, I've learned from this summit that uh, experts talking to experts will uh, see opportunities to work together to set up uh, projects, particularly now we have in Europe the Green Deal call, and I, I've seen several ideas for, for uh, since morning um, during these presentations. Personally, I'm interested to talk to three or four colleagues, but probably I will try to um, approach them after the event. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Dr. Delia Dimitriou from Connected Places Catapult United Kingdom. We further invite Ms. Emma Marr from Intelligent Cargo System, United Kingdom. She is the head of operations and she will discuss about cloud-based technologies for smart maritime transport. And she in particular will discuss about cargo made. Thank you, Christina, and, uh, and thanks everybody for inviting us to be here today. Um, Christina, should I share my screen or do you have a presentation? I'll go ahead and share. Sure. Okay, there we go. Right, brilliant. Okay, so uh, as Christina said, my name is Emma Mark. I'm the head of operations for Intelligent Cargo Systems, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about how Cargo Mate can help. Uh, work with shipping companies and keep vessels on schedule and reduce fuel consumption and, of course, uh, harmful emissions as well. Uh, but first, I'd like to outline how the maritime industry is working towards the sustainable development goals using port call optimization. So if we skip to the next slide. Thank you. So the International Harbour Masters Association defines port call optimization as the process of realising reductions in environmental impact and improve safety and security management for shipping, terminals, and service providers. Specifically, implementing solutions to estimate the completion of cargo operations enables just-in-time planning of pilot on board, pre-planning of all port services, and planning to the next port. So essentially, it means that if you can work out, if you know when your cargo operations are gonna complete, then you can get to your next port on time without having to use excessive amounts of fuel and of course increase your emissions to get to that next port on time. Cargomate is the, uh, the world's first and only solution to fully address this problem. So what does it mean in terms of inefficiencies within the commercial industry? The next slide, please. Bunker fuel accounts for 40% of container shipping industry's costs, and with 67% of container ships arriving a day late into port, billions of dollars of bunkers are being wasted every year, and again, huge amounts of uh, harmful emissions into the atmosphere. So the only way to reduce this expense is to sail slower, and the only way to sail slower is to leave port early. Our research shows on average, vessels are idle in port uh, for 38 minutes before cargo operations actually begin. Gantries, which are the cranes that use to lift the containers, stand idle for 10% of the time during cargo operations. And on average, vessels are idle for over two and a half hours after cargo operations are complete before she actually departs port. So what can we do to help vessels stay on schedule, reduce their fuel consumption and those emissions? Meet Cargomate. Cargomate is, as I say, monitors cargo completion time for containers vessels in every port worldwide. It notifies crew and fleet managers if the vessel is going to be delayed or if it can depart early, helping to reduce fuel consumption and keep the fleet on schedule. So the handheld device that we're looking at on our left hand side, that's used on board. As I say, it works in every single port with no integration required from the terminal or the vessel. It doesn't hook up to any ship systems and it replaces traditional paper logbooks. So it just replaces a system that all of the crew are already very familiar with and very comfortable in using. It's exactly like using a smartphone that you probably all have in your hand at the moment. So not only does it simplify cargo operations, but it also helps to create a safer working environment for those on board. The dashboard, which you can see on the right hand side, is for shore based teams and it automatically forecasts when cargo operations will be complete using gantry productivity. 
and it notifies fleet managers and any other key actors within the port call uh, of the earliest potential de departure time. Cargo makes the world's first and only global real-time container ship cargo monitoring system. It helps vessels to sail early, sail slower, save fuel and reduce harmful emissions. The next slide. So proof, um, we have one example of, of several, but one is uh, a 750 TEU vessel. She was just doing a really short um, journey, but she was able to leave, because she was using cargo mate, she was able to leave port three hours ahead of schedule. Because of that, she was able to reduce her fuel costs by $1,600, and her emissions were reduced by 12 tonnes of CO2, which is a staggering amount for just one journey. And as I say, these are savings for just one very small vessel undertaking one very short voyage. Imagine what the savings could be, uh, in, in not even just in a financial term, but for in terms of the CO2 and for our environment and how we can achieve these sustainable goals. If we implemented this across the world's container fleet, we could achieve so much. So next slide, please. And finally, the fundamental principle behind port call optimization in all of its formats is to be more open with our data and to collaborate more, which is obviously what we're all doing here today. So we're actively promoting other solution providers and their products and services as part of our guides to port call optimization, because we very much believe that if we work together, we can achieve a sustainable future for the commercial shipping industry. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on how to operationalize transformative change. Uh, so my name is Sophia Furstenberg Stott, and I represent a micro consultancy, Furstenberg Maritime Advisory, which I share together with my husband, Connor. Next slide, please. And uh, we focus on helping the shipping, shipping industry with strategic pathways for transformation and decarbonization, especially. And we say here that we know that it is possible. It is possible to accomplish this transformative change, but it is uh, necessary to collaborate at systemic level to reach these goals. Next slide, please. And uh, I would like to use uh, this as an example to show you what I mean. This is a, a, a visual uh, map of um, um, uh, how the uh, opportunity of green ammonia as a shipping fuel can be looked at from various perspectives. And the point here is that um, green ammonia is something that is not available today. Uh, it is perhaps existing at the uh, pilot stage. There is no fuel maker producing green ammonia today. There are no engines currently operating on, on ammonia. There, uh, there is no fuel infrastructure. There are no regulations. Uh, the financing uh, pathways are uncertain. And at the same time, you need to be able to make informed decisions about the opportunity of alternative fuels such as green ammonia. And so in order to, to reach further on that decision pathway, you need to gather the, the, the value chain representatives and the stakeholders at systemic level to approach this uh, uh, kind of opportunity. So uh, looking at uh, where the energy comes from, the green electron to hydrogen, to ammonia, to the storage and bunkering, to the carrying as a cargo, to the powering of the machinery on board, to the, to the ammonia products and end users. And look at that from, from uh, the, the ship design, uh, the fuel and the infrastructure and the financing. And so when you have all that gathered, you can suddenly start to identify levers for change and you can start to identify the synergies across the entire spectrum. Next slide, please. So when you have all them gathered around the same table, you have a good starting point to, to, to deliver change. But uh, not only do you need that, but you also need to define your mutual goals, not only how you can move forward, but how all of you 
can move forward. And the, the major barriers we all are facing in the quest of transformative change is the massive risk picture. So how can we all help each other to reduce that risk? And not least to jointly explore new business models together. Next slide, please. And when you have done that, so you, you know how you together can deliver success um, collaboratively, you will also uh, have a, a, a better overview of the external uh, um, barriers uh, or external key enablers for your success. And some of these external factors, you as a, as a coalition or consortium can have impact to, and some of them you can't. But it's important for you to understand what they are and, what, and, and, and how, you can, how you can nudge them towards the, 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 the goal that you have set for yourself. So what, what are the key technology enablers, the regulatory enablers, the financial ones, and the policy ones? Um, to have that picture will also give you a better overview of your risk. Next slide, please. And then you need to go back to the table with your coalition and go a little bit deeper into what are the synergies that we can create together uh, across this value chain? What are, what are the benefits with having increased visibility up and downstream from where you sit? How is that reducing your financial risk? And is it perhaps enabling you to, 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 to reach scale faster? And is it helping you to set new standards or reducing the cost across that value chain? Next slide, please. And even with that, you have to accept the fact that you have still so many uncertainties, but you need to be able to make investment decisions, perhaps not today, but soon enough. And so you need to establish scenarios. You need to understand uh, what are different likelihoods? What, 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 are the, what are the costs? What are the timelines? What are the regulations? When will they come uh, in place? Uh, how much can the cost redu be reduced? And how can we manage those gaps? And work with these different scenarios to help you to make better decisions. Because investment in, uh, in new fuel infrastructures and smart transport, therefore, is very, very costly. Next slide, please. So I think I have used my, my five minutes and uh, my, my last point is that when you have uh, this insight uh, about the opportunity to transform shipping to zero carbon fuels, you will also see how shipping as an entity can help catalyze the transformation in the other industries as well. You have my contact details there and thank you so much for listening. We also thank you very much, Sofia. And we are inviting further uh, Ms. Elitsa Panayotova. She will discuss about Sofia's path to sustainability, improving mobility. So my name is Elitsa Panayotova and I am a coordinator of a project under the title of Sofia Green. It was uh, created four years ago if you could go, uh, Christina, to the next slide. And it sits in the Soviet Development Association, which is a sort of, a, um, it's a foundation, non-for-profit, and its goal is to be a bridge between the municipal administration and the different other stakeholders, businesses, non-for-profit organizations, NGOs, uh, citizens, just to be able to unite our efforts behind the common goals for sustainable and greener cities that uh, we want to live in. And our formal uh, task is also to prepare the candidacy of the capital of Bulgaria, the city of Sofia, for the European Green Capital Award, which is a very nice uh, motivation for the city administrations to um, coordinate their efforts into improving the, the life in the cities. And I was kindly asked uh, by Christina, if you could uh, show the next slide, to give uh, my idea of what uh, the future of uh, mobility beholds. 
So I think that it will be less uh, cars, less privately owned cars uh, that would be used as the means of trans transportation in the city. More, um, more shared mobility, which we see happening even as we speak. It's becoming a present, not only a future, but the scale will be different. And the third and most important thing for me is the smaller perim perimeter of daily commute. Probably you've all seen that Paris has announced its goal to turn Paris into a 15-minute city, which in other, way, uh, in other words means that from where you live to where you work, to where you shop or to where you do sports, you need a 15-minute perimeter. And that's actually the planning of the cities will transform the mobility. And that's why mobility is very, very tightly linked to the way we will change the urban structure of the cities. Next slide, please. What uh, Sofia is doing, and actually our small team, we are trying to promote different initiatives, no matter whether they're coming from the municipality or private businesses or startup companies, just to promote them and to see what the city needs to do in order for them to be become more popular and uh, to be uh, used on a larger um, larger basis. And these are three examples of such initiatives. We organized, we supported one startup company that was producing uh, electric bikes. And we, and uh, for three years now, they are offering a sharing, shared bicycle system. And with these bikes, you can go up the Vitusha mountain and anyone with any, a uh, level of physical activity with this electric bike could actually choose a very sustainable way to enjoy the mountain next to Sofia. Another example is the shared e-scooters. All of the European cities uh, have them nowadays. But what we managed to do last year when we understood that the three companies would be entering the Bulgarian market, we sat on a table with them uh, and we prepared a sort of the a memorandum of how they will operate on the territory of the city of Sofia. We also marked 200 spaces uh, for those uh, shared scooters to be parked on the streets. And we did that before actually the uh, services were put in operation, which made the whole system much easier, much control, uh, more controllable, and it didn't create uh, a chaos that many of the other cities witnessed at the beginning of those services. And uh, what we can also mention is that we have the first electric car sharing system, which is um, a partnership between a Bulgarian company and an Estonian company. And they're growing this system, not only in the limits of the city of Sofia, but they're also going across border to Romania and other cities in order to provide that shared uh, electric car uh, usage. Next slide, please. This is, uh, I'm giving just a short, ex uh, brief example of what the city of Sofia is doing on a more larger scale. We are developing the metro uh, and we recently opened the third metro diameter in Sofia. Then 90% uh, of our buses are Euro 6 standard as of today. We're increasing our number of gas fueled and also electric buses as we speak. And from this year, we are also doing um, a pilot project of an electric bus on demand service. So based on the results, we'll be also sharing them with the other cities, the result of that uh, project, and we'll see how we can implement it on a larger scale. Next slide, please. Uh, Two years ago, we started an initiative which we called Walk to School Initiative, and we had initially three schools jumping in that uh, pilot project. What we did is we analyzed where the um, kids that uh, study in those streets live, what are the different ways uh, through which they uh, commute to the school, how many they walk, how far do they live, uh, whether they're using public uh, transportation or cars. We also check the perimeter of the schools to see where the infrastructure needs to be improved in order to be safer for the kids to, uh, for the kids to walk. And then we had uh, meetings with their parents, meetings with the teachers, and also play different games with the kids in order to promote the benefits of walking and not driving your kids to school. 
uh, which also has an effect on the concentration of kids in the classroom, on their social and socializing skills, on their attitude towards the environment they inhabit, and also that drastically changes the um, traffic uh, jams and also drastically changes the air pollution uh, generated by traffic. Next slide, please. At present, we are developing that project further. We have more uh, schools that have uh, volunteered to participate in the initiative. And we are also now working uh, with the um, um, uh, Irish uh, startup company on uh, designing uh, school bus routes. But the, here, the trick is that we are not uh, providing uh, each school with a bus, but we are collecting kids um, let's say from different neighborhoods and uh, the bus stops at two or three um, schools located in the city center. So actually one bus services a certain area of the city and uh, collects the kids and drops them at the three schools in which they're studying in the city center. Thus again, helping to alleviate the traffic. This is our first year. So this uh, pilot project will be starting within a month and we'll be very interested to see how it uh, develops, what are the responses from the parents and then we'll be able to launch it on a larger scale. Next slide, please. At present, as two years ago, we conducted uh, um, streets and on-site measurements of the emissions of the cars. We are doing this in partnership with a um, Spanish company that is providing the technology and actually each vehicle while passing through that uh, stationed equipment can see what is the level of the emissions. Uh, the previous time that we do the measurement, we had 20,000 uh, individual separate measurements. And based on the analysis, we found out that 6% of those cars or those vehicles, uh, vehicles are the high polluters, high emitters, and they contribute to 80% of the pollution. So now after we finish the second uh, phase of the measurement, we'll be able to draw much more precise conclusions and then target those 6% of the vehicles. And thus we are hoping to achieve um, a great result because if 6% are contributing to 80% of the pollution, if you target those 6%, uh, you can really have a very big effect on the air pollution generated by traffic. Thank you very much. We also thank you, dear Elitsa. You shared a lot of interesting ideas, and I really hope the participants to this summit will collaborate having such ideas. We further have a presentation from Mr. Joseph Lau Yui. He is uh, the director of uh, the Asian Research Center from Hong Kong, he, uh, and he represents the European Center of Social Responsibility, and his presentation is related to electric cars, a new direction of Hong Kong, smart city. Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph, and so that um, today I would like to share about the electric cars. How about the new directions of Hong Kong smart city? And so that I came from the Division of Business and Hospitality Management, College of Professional and Continuing Education, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, as well as the representative of Euro European Center for Social Responsibility of Asian Research Center in Hong Kong. And so that actually that uh, from the Hong Kong government, actually they have the blueprint issued about how to develop Hong Kong as a smart city. And so that in order to achieve about Hong Kong as a smart city, there are the three main objectives. The first one is to make use of innovative and technology to address some urban challenges and problems. And how to enhance the effectiveness of city management and how to improve the people's quality of life as well as Hong Kong's sustainability, efficiency and safety. And so that the sustainability is very important in order to maintain how to enhance Hong Kong as a green city. 
And the second objective is to enhance Hong Kong attractiveness to the global business and talents, as well as Hong Kong is an international trading center and also is a key about the entry port uh, since the 1842. And as well as Hong Kong as a transshipment hub and so that Hong Kong smart city is about to how to deal with the uh, com competitions with the laboring cities. And also how to inspire continuous city innovation and sustainable economic development. And so the city innovations most likely use about the big data, use the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0 is very, very important issues. And so that I would like to share about the smart city nowadays, Hong Kong is down to very hot topics about the electric car. And so that I can give you about some of the pictures about the electric car. In uh, in Hong Kong, actually, that is a uh, has a lack of infrastructure. How to support about the electric car, and and there are the academic institutions. Probably you has already tried to innovate some of the electric car. How to develop in the in the public as well. And so the what are the challenges of the electric car? The first one is actually uh, as our Hong Kong citizens, uh, it is the lack of communication and information on the topic. And so on, so that uh, no one has the idea and also the picture what is the meaning of the electric car and what are the concepts of the electric car so that there is a lack of the awareness and knowledge on that. And second one is about that if I the car owner uh, or the car user, how, which of the incentives that I can gain to use about the electric car is the financial incentive or operational incentive is still has a questionable issues. And third one, as I mentioned, is a lack of charging infrastructure in the highway, in the shopping mall, or in the some of the car park is still is a problem about that. And also the charging time is quite very slow in Hong Kong. And so that I think it is need to um increase the charge speed up about the charging time, especially Hong Kong is a busy center and Hong Kong is a is not very tolerant to waiting such about a long time. And also the concern about the price about the electric vehicles compared with the traditional vehicles. And they very concerned about very price in price price sensitive about that. And because electric car is still very concerned about what are the price will be charging in the future. And also what are the specialties that the electronic vehicles currently are available. It just can still maintain about the functions. If that is not our uh, electric car as well, and so that they are much of concern, and also that's why it's a face different challenges on that. And so that what the way forward of the electric car. The first one, the Hong government want to provide some of the incentive about some of the electric car, how to motivate people to accept about the electric car. And also second one is about the roadmap. Nowadays, the academic institutions want to develop some of the roadmap and uh, develop some of the roadmap, how to uh, install some of the infrastructure to support about the electric car for the electricity supply. And so that's how days I still have the some of the project to do some of the Google roadmap to support about the driver use about the electric car. And also the public transport nowadays, the ele electric taxi also used about the concept about the electric car and also bus, mini bus whatsoever. And also the infrastructure is uh, how to maintain about the advanced infrastructure is about very important charging facilities. And the uh, teleco support is also very concerned and also to uh, evaluate about some of the capital costs and structures about that. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. From Babes Bolia University from Romania, Ms. Kodruta Mare, she is associate professor and she will have a presentation with Professor Dr. Titus Mann on sustainable mobility and transportation. We are uh, speaking about sustainable mobility in the Cluj metropolitan area because um, one area of research uh, in the research center that I'm uh, activating is sustainable mobility and transportation. So Together with the Cluj-Napoca City Hall, European Commission, cities, the City Science Initiative, 
we are involved in a, a very uh, broad project, sustainable mobility in public transport, with the vision of attracting of public transport in a sustainable transport system and having as end goals efficiency and environment and health. So an efficient travel with low impact on environment um, and health. Uh, this research I told you is conducted in cooperation with the city of Cluj-Napoca and there are um, there is a team made up of uh, colleagues from three faculties of the Babes Bay University, which are all members of um, the interdisciplinary center for data science. A project within the project, to call it like that, is the one that I'm going to talk to you about today: accessibility of public services using the public transport system having as objectives um, investigating the elements of the public transport network that ensure efficient accessibility and connectivity, and of course, developing, developing and substantiating public policies to improve urban uh, mobility. Uh, the project has a lot of results. Among them, I, I just picked up something. For example, here you have the school bus networks, and uh, the previous speaker, uh, fra Elitsa from uh, Bulgaria, also spoke about um, the school bus networks. Then in the right part of the slide, you have um, the travel time in minutes to the closest bus station. Uh, this is the Cluj-Napoca, Cluj metropolitan area and as expected you can see that towards the external limits of um, the metropolitan area there are um, problems in this respect. When we started this project we also forecasted the inc an increase of around 3 percent in 2020 in the public transport demand. Of course the present pandemic situation um, came up and um, destroyed, to call it like that, our forecast. That is why we have also conducted a, uh, an additional research to see the impact of COVID-19 upon the public transport demand. And you can clearly see our reference, which is um, the 4th of March, 2020, and how public transportation demand has evolved in the emergency uh, and then alert state declared by the Romanian government. Um, I told you that the goal of this project was to support the public policies and decision making because um, Cluj-Napoca uh, and the Cluj metropolitan area have um, an approach related to sustainability. So everything related to green, reliable public transport, availability, affordability, and so on. As future research directors within this project, we have cycling mobility, walkable city, shared mobility, micro mobility, electric and autonomous transportation. Uh, in all these uh, future directions, we also uh, work with uh, some of the most important companies activating on the local market, entity data, Bosch, Accenture, and so on. In the right part, um, you have the newest modernized uh, street, Main Street uh, in Cluj-Napoca. Uh, it is called the Good Day Street, and you can clearly see uh, the approach towards uh, mobility without a car. So you can clearly see the um, bicycle areas, green areas, and so on. Here you have um, the shared bike. Um, map in uh, the Cluj metropolitan area. Thank you very much for inviting me today. It was a great pleasure to um, hear 
such uh, interesting issues from different areas of research related to uh, and different approaches related to smart transportation and mobility. Here you have the contact details uh, related to our research center and we are looking forward to um, working with any of you in uh, data analysis issues related to smart mobility and transportation. Thank you very much. Thank you also, dear Kadruza. I invite uh, Dr. Gabriela Badia from Ovidis University of Constanza. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Christina, for having me in such a, a very interesting event. My name is Gabriela Bada. I am a PhD lecturer at Faculty of Mathematics and Informatics of Vidius University of Constanta. And as you see in my title, I will talk to you about blockchain technology. Uh, I am the leader of uh, this project for partner for Ovidius um, University of Constanta, which is a partner in a, a great partnership financed by Erasmus Plus. So uh, we have called our project Blockchain for Entrepreneurs, a non-traditional industry 4.0 curriculum for higher education. And um, since the action key, which is funding us, is a cooperation for innovation and the exchange of good practices, uh, more precisely strategic partnership for higher education, I think we can submit ourselves to the fourth SDG, that is uh, the one related uh, with education and quality education, and of course the 17th one, uh, which uh, refers to pa uh, partnerships uh, for education in our uh, case. So, um, uh, okay, let me just... Okay. So, as I said, we are... Um, seven institutions within this partnership um, from five different countries. From Romania, the project leader is Bucharest University of Economic Studies, and we have also an IT company, which is ZTEC Rom Romania. Um, still from academia side, we have a partner, which is uh, Taltec University from Estonia. We are happy to have them because as you may know, um, Estonia is one of the leading countries in implementing blockchain technology nowadays, and they have uh, revolutionized their payments and cryptocurrencies and uh, uh, social databases and so on. But they are sharing knowledge within this partnership with us. Uh, we have a partner uh, IT company from Greece, one from Italy, and one from Latvia. So we are targeting students trainers and entrepreneurs uh, and stakeholders. I have marked this last category because um, today's summit I think is about stakeholders and uh, it's a very nice opportunity for us to present our project here and uh, why not maybe establish some contacts in order to develop some curriculum or some um, study materials which refer to transport and logistics that are uh, blockchain based. Uh, developed. So thank you, Christina, for having us here. Um, our project, as I said, is to collaborate in a networked platform uh, in order to develop curriculum and to provide teachers, students, and entrepreneurs and stakeholders, of course, knowledge and skills on blockchain and the knowledge about uh, use cases and the famous applications that are using blockchain uh, in order to um, shift the mind of stakeholders and all actors in uh, their um, businesses. So the project is um, organized in seven intellectual output. As I said, we are trying to develop curriculum and study materials for teachers, trainers, and then for students and entrepreneurs. All of them will be uploaded on an e-learning platform, which will be available on our website, which is blocks.ac.ro. We have in mind presenting these materials in a more interactive way, and uh, this is why we uh, will uh, develop a blocks game, which will also be available on blocks.ac.ro. Um, now, if we... Uh, Take a look at blockchain in transport uh, industry and 
logistics, uh, let me say that blockchain continues to be a buzzword in the nowadays technologies because um, I think it's one technology that uh, it actually can uh, revolutionize also transport and not only that. So um, we can say that um, logistic and transportation industry is one of the most important beneficiaries of uh, transport of uh, blockchain implementation, because as you see here, there are several solutions blockchain based already implemented throughout the world and Probably in transport industry, most famous one is Trade Lens, which is a digital shipment platform uh, provided by IBM with Maersk that enables transparency and collaboration and most of all efficiency in a global supply chain. Uh, let me say it is blockchain based, so it is probably uh, the most important solution that uh, operates today and it is related to transport, and I uh, wanted to share with you this idea. Also, Walmart has revolutionized its supply chain by pushing all its transactions through blockchain, and that increases transparency. Um, Batavia is a um, solution given by five banks that are uh, trying, with the help of IBM, again IBM, to uh, provide transparency in uh, transaction recordings um, in order for transportation through land, sea, and uh, uh, air routes. And of course, the two major producers, Toyota and Porsche, that have announced that they are uh, testing blockchain solutions already, which may revolutionize the way we drive our cars, our electric cars, why not? Because uh, that was a topic previously. So blockchain may have its impact, and I think um, we can um, have this in a separate topic, maybe, because in the project we uh, are trying to organize webinars and seminars delivered online, also information sessions and summer schools for students, and I'll be happy to host a webinar, if it is possible, why not, with a special guest even for, from today's summit. Uh, in order to discuss the impact of blockchain in transport um, and logistics. So um, you can contact us uh, um, if you are interested in uh, having this kind of topic, uh, discussion on this topic with us. Sure, we can uh, manage to um, deliver some study materials that refer transportation in our e-learning platform. There will be some learning paths uh, implemented, so maybe one path can lead to use cases related to transportation and logistics. So stay tuned for more details about this project on our website, blogs.asset.ro, and on Facebook, we are Project Talks. There you can see uh, our previous webinars um, because we are already hosting such events. And I'll be happy to host one maybe with the topic related to transportation. I think I have uh, managed to, to present my project very briefly, but uh, of course the topic of blockchain in transportation can be developed in a very, very nice event uh, dedicated to it. So, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you also. And uh, now we have ended all the presentations and we are inviting our debate speakers to share their perspectives related to the following question. So please, Mr. Svein David Menhoff from Norwegian Maritime Authority, share your perspective. Concern to the last, but uh, the UN Sustainability Goals 17 on development uh, contribution with regard to, uh, to, to, to uh, co-working together. So I, I believe all these five last uh, sustainability goals is uh, is essential for, for 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 the smart transport sector. Yes, uh, yes, we have already heard today um, that uh, the smart uh, transport sector already contributes to to a lot of the, the the accomplishment of the SDGs in many ways. And the more we look into it, uh, the more ways we actually find. Um, I would like to emphasize on some important aspects within uh, the sector that can or already gives uh, additional contributions to, to the SDGs. Um, and a good example to begin with can be the IMO strategy 
to at least half the annual greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping by 2050, compared with 2008. And uh, this is a great initiative, and that is not only because it contributes to the accomplishment of the, the, uh, the SDGs by the climate gas reductions alone. No, it uh, forces us to think smarter, to cooperate, to invent, and make use of the new technology and carbon neutral fuels and electricity. And moreover, the, the long-term strategy uh, along with the, the transparent and open dialogue that we have uh, within the IMO, it gives the industry and the governments uh, necessary predictability uh, to risk uh, in uh, the investments in the, in, in the new technologies. Um, uh, I do think we need to focus even more on how we should better facilitate the development of new and emerging technologies. And the governments and authorities and administrations like the NCA, where, where I'm from, we need to be clearer in our goals. So there's no doubt about where we want to go. And we need to be more transparent in our long-term planning processes. Uh, in addition, we also need to be offensive uh, in removing any barriers to the development while we at the same time, of course, have to ensure that we maintain or strengthen the high quality of maritime safety that we already have in place today. Um, uh, to give an example of a possible unfortunately barrier to development, it may be the clear administrative distinction that we have uh, between had now between land and sea-based activities. And connectivity is a key element in the smart transport sector. So closer cooperation between stakeholders at sea in the air or on land, I think that's a, a prerequisite for success. And this also includes to collaborate on common standards across modes of transport. Yes. Uh, to end off, I'm not going to take too much time, uh, but uh, I would say that the blue economy must be a green economy. And the blue economy should contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and minimize environmental footprint. And moreover, the business models of the blue economy should also strive towards establishing a circular blue economy, uh, making sustainability the underlying principle of production at sea. I think this is needed to increase the contributions to the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trond. Let's see the perspective of uh, Mr. Bogdan Niza, General Manager of CityBus. Even at being defined at Literam, the UN SDGs can be found in our programmatic document. So one thing is clear, is crystal clear, we cannot achieve it without efforts in seeking sustainable solution for our problem and needs. Technological learning and innovation are essential for economic growth and development and are a major determinant of long-term improvements in income and living standards. While in the more advanced economics, technological progress involves the generation of new knowledge that can be applied to productive activity. For my country in Constanza City, progress is strongly influenced by our ability to access, adapt and diffuse technological knowledge that has been generated mainly abroad. For example, the public transport operator for city of Constanza, City Bus, is implementing now an ERP, one of the best, SAP S4 HANA, in order to make internal expenditures transparent and to improve the reporting process. The solution will help City Bus to ensure transparency in spending public money, increasing the company's image, improving the relationship with employees and with the City Hall of Constanza, the only shareholders, by making operating costs transparent. Using the ERP provides a great support for all these goals, helping City Bus achieve a more sustainable approach to public transport. So we can optimize natural, natural resource consumption, expenditures, and minimize emissions and pollution levels. Talking about emission pollution, also Romania is still struggling into adapting and, and embracing low emission solution. In Constanza, City Bus has given technical support to Constanza City Hall in a, in a project that aim replacing the current public transport fleet with electrical vehicles. The project implies buying in the first phase more than 40 electrical buses. Also, as a part of seeking sustainable solutions, city buses started, started to implement e-ticketing, ABT, account-based ticketing, that will easy buying tickets and journey passes, reducing paper waste and converting ticketing from classic to smart. Also, implementing e-ticketing ABT is the beginning of integrating all city experiences into a complex system that connects all facilities needed in Constanza, from parking tickets to museum tickets, 
taxes and other fees. E-ticketing is the first step for implementing a city car that can fulfill all mobility needs for citizens. Of course, smart is not easy. Smart means adapting, learning, improving, improving, always seeking for best solution for our needs and problem. But smart is the key for a better future. So we must be ready to demolish reality as we all know it and build a smart one. Future is smart, so we should be the same. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Director Renica. We further give the floor to Mr. Mandres Irako Arison. He is the Director for International Cooperation of Antananarivo Municipality from Madagascar. Yes, uh, good day, everyone. It is a premiere for uh, Antananarivo to participate in this kind of event, and for that, uh, we really want to, to thank uh, the UN. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, briefly uh, present a few projects uh, that uh, we believe directly or indirectly uh, contribute to meeting the SDGs. Uh, it, it is to be known that uh, Antananarivo uh, is the capital of Madagascar with uh, approximately 1.2 million uh, inhabitants in its uh, municipality and 2.6 million uh, inhabitants in its greater area. And there are over 3,000 kilometers of road in the city where all the major roads converge at the center. Uh, a study is currently underway with the World Bank to improve bus operations efficiency which are the main transport means for uh, 300,000 residents and to define infrastructure improvement strategies. Bus optimization, we believe, will have a greater impact on accessibility to jobs compared to the construction of ring roads or the introduction of rail passenger surfaces to boost economic activity. We are also reviewing the, the current traffic plan to reduce uh, congestion, limit time spent uh, in traffic and improve air quality. A big consideration of this uh, new traffic plan uh, will be the, the, the limitation of access to the center of the city for suburban buses and the optimization of urban public transport to limit overlapping routes. Because that is the main problem here in Antananarivo is that uh, we have many cooperatives that uh, manage the buses. We have about 50 of those and they work inefficiently. So really want to optimize the, the management of those. In addition, uh, we, are, we have started the implementation of uh, geolocalization geo uh, devices on these buses for us to monitor their activity and to make sure they follow operational specification. Because something that really happens a lot too is the buses not following specification. Uh, they deserve other places they're not supposed to, to, uh, to, 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 to serve. And uh, it creates a, a total chaos in the city. In terms of uh, parking management, uh, we are currently transferring the capacity of a private company, uh, which has uh, managed parking lots in designated areas of the city with ticket machines. So we're trying to transfer the capacity to the municipality for us to optimize the management of these operations, but also to extend payment methods for the, the large public. Uh, so these payment methods uh, are gonna allow them to pay their taxes di uh, directly to the, to the city. And this will, in turn, limit uh, the use of cash or so limit the corruption. We also have plans to elevate a few marketplaces and to create parking lots under them. The reason, we've, uh, the re the reason is uh, we have a lot of rural mig migration around the city. And so we have more and more street vendors. And these people, they largely, they largely contribute to traffic congestion by occupying sidewalks and even streets. So we want to increase the amount of, parkings, of parking spaces available mm -hmm. while giving vendors an opportunity to pursue their activity. And so in addition to elevating marketplaces and creating uh, new parking spaces, uh, we are also creating a 4,000 uh, meter square uh, parking lot dedicated specifically to the sale of used vehicles. This is a major, uh, this is a problem that is very specific to Antananarivo because Importing and selling used cars has become an important activity for citizens here. And we want to allow them to pursue their activity without occupying uh, potential parking spaces and other, uh, other, other public spaces. Um, that, that will be all for me for now. Uh, I believe I will have two more minutes after to, to end my uh, intervention. Thank you. Well, okay, third. Professor Dr. Angelica Bailon, what do you think is your perspective from the Philippines' point of view? Yes, thank you. 
The uh, Sustainable Development Goals serve as the blueprint of the smart transport sector to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. The Sustainable Development Goals address the global challenges we face, including poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace, and justice. The global challenges would therefore require smart global partnership. Note that the emphasis is global partnership, not just international partnership, which means that partnership must be worldwide, involving the entire world, not just between two or more countries. Having said that, on the question how, the smart transport sector can only contribute to all the 17 SDGs through a smart, intelligent transport system. How? Making the transport system convenient, fast, safety, and secure to the society or people worldwide. Second, reducing emission of carbon dioxide that cause global warming for a better environmental impact globally. And third, ensuring better profit for businesses due to faster travel time, quick and efficient delivery of goods, services, and people contributing to productivity, economic growth, and quality of life for peace and prosperity in the whole world due to domino effect. There are six challenges faced by the smart transport sector. These are funding, um, traffic congestion, safety, environment, public transport system, and security. Due to time constraint, let me focus on the funding challenge and how to address this. Funding is a challenge to the government, but this can be leveraged through public-private partnership and through smart global partnership. Philippines, for example, collaborated with Korea on TOPIS for the next three years, starting 2019. And earlier, I presented that it addresses uh, six SDGs, SDG 3, 4, 5, 9, 11, and 12. One of the key quantifiable benefits that smart transport system can bring is saving in time, which can be translated in economic savings for travelers, uh, the freight industry, and the country in the long run. On smart global partnership, it would be prudent for investors from developing countries for developed rather from developed countries to invest in least developed countries like the Philippines for quick return of investment or profit and for strengthening science, uh, science, technology and innovation capacity beneficial for the society and environment and second to promote European sustainable technologies in developing countries like the Philippines at the same time share knowledge in the spirit of mutual cooperation to access science and technology contributing to sustainable development goals. This may be done through signing of memorandum of understanding and agreement um, among this um, among different stakeholders or institution. That ends my three minute uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Chris Jones from Intelligence Cargo Systems from the United Kingdom. Please share your thoughts. Thank you. Um, good day, everyone. And thank you for inviting us today. It's a, a real privilege to be part of this excellent discussion. Um, I'll give you the, the sort of the background from the startup within this, this industry, if you will. So it's Intelligent Cargo Systems. We strongly believe the development and promotion of smart maritime transport processes should be a catalyst for balanced and sustainable growth for both developing and developed countries. A major component of smart maritime transport is the use of technology solutions to improve and automate communications and data sharing between relevant maritime stakeholders. Within a port, these actors may include the port authority, vessel traffic services and the vessels themselves. And globally, this can include the carrier and cargo owner and other intermodal transport segments. Currently, the communications and data sharing methods used within the industry are old fashioned legacy technologies such as phone calls and faxes. And collaboration between different stakeholders is often forced rather than for mutual benefit. As such, the smart maritime transport processes being developed are largely only being undertaken by well-developed and well-funded hub ports with the benefits being available locally. 
Smart maritime transport technology solutions do not need to be expensive infrastructure projects with long timescale commitments. In fact, this is why maritime technology startups like us exist. We seek the most cost effective solutions to global problems that can be implemented and utilized as quickly as possible to the benefit of multiple global stakeholders in real time. Doing so allows us to lower the barrier to entry for the least developed nations to contribute to a smart maritime ecosystem, whilst ensuring that technologies developed today are suitable for both well-served and underserved markets. As mentioned in the talk by Dr. Kupsa from IMO, I would argue that seafarers are currently an underserved market too. The benefits of implementing these innovations are large scale. Through improved communication and data sharing, we can eradicate wastage and inefficiencies from the ecosystem, leading to more reliable transport networks with lower costs, especially for the end consumer. This in turn will lead to growth opportunities for least developed countries through lower costs and increased potential for collaboration. Our efforts to move towards smart transportation solutions are noble and necessary to reach the sustainable development goals, but we must ensure that we collaborate as partners to ensure a positive global outcome. I realize my talks are slightly shorter than everyone else's, but hopefully you understand where we're coming from. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um, yes, uh, to conclude uh, this uh, debate, I would like to reiterate um, for emphasis, not for redundancy, that the smart transport uh, sector um, contributes to the 17 uh, SDGs when and only if it addresses transport challenges worldwide in smart partnership with other countries with focus on people, planet, and profit. These are the sustainable dimensions or the three Ps which are integrated or linked together resulting to sustainable development for peace and prosperity. The Smart uh, Transport Summit initiated and organized ably spearheaded by Romania undoubtedly contributed to the attainment of, the, of at least five SDGs either directly or indirectly, particularly uh, SDG 3, SDG 4, SDG 5, SDG 10, and SDG 17. That is specifically good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality and inclusivity, reduce inequality, and partnership to achieve the goal of this Smart Transport Summit. Certainly, education, information, and awareness through global partnership using digital technology amidst COVID-19 for health, safe security of the participants, yet very productive due to scholarly insights among the stakeholders and participants composed of men and women is a key in contributing to sustainable development goals. With that, I congratulate organizers and sponsors, particularly my good friend, Dr. Christina Dragomir, the host and moderator of the Smart Transport Summit for this relevant and timely event. My salute and cheers from the Philippines. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that uh, smart transport is, uh, is still a new concept for, uh, for the city of Antananarivo because we come from a very, uh, one of the least developed countries. And we, we still haven't fully grasped the concept, but we are in the process of implementing the, uh, the idea. I also, also wanted to add about uh, maritime transport. The, the city of Antananarivo does not directly benefit from maritime transport because we are located in the islands of the, of the country. But the port of, of Tamata, though, which is closest to the city of Antananarivo and the largest of the country, is the main port from which goods transit before embarking on a 350 kilometer serious road trip to the capital. That is the main aspect to be considered. And constructions are also on the way of the Jika, the port of Tamata, to extend its capacity as well as to, as to extend the draft for, for larger cargo ships to be able to access the port. Hence, the flow of trade is expected to grow starting from 2022, and the year of construction, the year the, year the constructions are expected to be completed uh, in 2022, with an important impact on Antananarivo regarding business opportunities. That will be all for me. Thank you. 
I also thank you. We wanted to develop such a project like Smart Transport Summit because this is the place where several actors from the society meet and discuss about important needs and solutions for such needs. Our endeavor is to further develop the project by developing with each year a further edition of the summit with the more participants and more ideas and not only these effective solutions and effective projects and actions that were delivered in the same goal of achievement and accomplishment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this would be largely my conclusion. We are just waiting for your contribution for the next year and we are also inviting other participants like um, institutions, non-governmental agencies, of course the business environment which is the key for uh, development. We are also inviting intergovernmental agency of the United Nations and of course the academia and the research that you already have seen participating intensively to our summit from today.